Hello there. I was just reading this book, The Anatomy of Fascism by Robert Paxton. There is no one size fits all definition to fascism. In fact, that's what makes it so effective. The fact that there is no one size fits all definition. Fascism is an insidious thing that changes its shape and form so it can go undetected to cause the most trouble. But the one thing fascism does do is try to obliterate and subjugate the other. Fascism is smart and it can change so it can go unnoticed until it's too late and before you know it, fascism has taken over. Nazi Germany? That is not how fascism begins. That is how fascism ends. So there's no point looking out for stuff like that happening right now because you won't find it. That's the end goal, not how things currently are. Over these next two videos, we're going to be looking at two different essays on fascism to see what we can learn about how to find and detect fascists and fascism. In this video, we'll be looking at the book, The Anatomy of Fascism by Robert Paxton, and what he describes as the mobilizing passions of fascism. Then in the next video, we'll be looking at Umberto Eco's essay, uh, Fascism. But for now, we're just concentrating on The Anatomy of Fascism by Robert Paxton. What, oh yeah, I threw away, didn't I? Okay, I'll just have to do it off the top of my head then. The mobilizing passions of fascists. A sense of overwhelming crisis beyond the reach of traditional solutions that can only be fixed by the fascists and their leader. The primacy of the group towards which one has duty superior to every right, whether individual or universal, and the subordination of the individual to it. The belief that one's group is a victim, a sentiment that justifies any action without legal or moral limits against its enemies, both internal and external. Dread of the group's decline under the corrosive effects of individual liberalism, class conflict and alien influences. The need for closer integration of a purer community, by consent if possible, or by exclusionary violence if necessary. The need for authority by natural chiefs, always male, culminating in a national chieftain who alone is capable of incarnating the group's historic destiny. The superiority of the leader's instincts over abstract and universal reason. The beauty of violence and the efficiency of will when they are devoted to the group's success. The right of the chosen people to dominate others without restraint from any kind of human or divine law. Right being decided by the sole criterion of the group's prowess within a Darwinian struggle. So, in closing, what does all that mean? What is fascism when we boil it down to its essentials? Well, fascism may be defined as a form of political behaviour marked by obsessive preoccupation with community decline, humiliation or victimhood, and by compensatory cults of unity, energy and purity, in which a mass-based party of committed nationalist militants, working in an uneasy but effective collaboration with traditional elites, abandons democratic liberties and pursues with redemptive violence and without ethical or legal restraint goals of internal cleansing and external expansion. So there you have it, Robert Paxson's mobilizing passions for fascism. So with that out of the way, is that all there is to fascism? Sadly not. Now to be a fascist you don't have to meet every criteria on this list. In fact, Many fascist groups will do whatever they can to make sure they don't fit every description on this list. They'll use obfuscation, try and hide the fact of what they're actually doing. Uh, a common thing you might see, definitely like 4chan boards and that, is use of irony or joking. You know, say something racist, go, ha ha ha, it's okay, uh, it's only joking, as if that makes it okay. Do not fall for these tactics. They are fascist tactics and they are using them specifically so they don't meet the criteria of what fascism is. And why do they do it? It's simple, to trick people in to joining them, but also so things like the mainstream media and your average person won't realise that they actually are fascist. And as such, they'll probably get more coverage and stuff, probably be talked about more, as opposed to if they actually were fascist and were overt about it, they'd be shut down, shunned, and will get no mainstream media attention. It's a game, basically. It's a way for them to get into the spotlight and to recruit more members. 
but now you know this, you can defend against it. Because if you look at what they actually say, the fascists, to peel away all the words they've used, peel away the dog whistles and have a look, what you'll see is just naked racism, prejudice, homophobia, sexism, anti-Semitism, it's all there. They just hide it. The years they've managed to hide it better, so it's much more harder to spot a fascist. And that is what makes fascism so effective, the fact that it is so hard to find and pinpoint. But if you know what you're looking for, it's all there and you can find it. With that done, we've now looked at The Anatomy of Fascism by Robert Paxton. So, oh, I don't know why I did that again. Next week, we'll be looking at Umberto Eco's essay, Ur Fascism, to see what he defines as fascism. And I think you'll find there's a lot of crossover between these lists. So, thank you for watching. Stay beautiful.